Tunisia will sing, Heal Our Land. And so he brings Daniel in to interpret the dream and to see what it's 
about, and that's what I'm going to read about. Okay. King Nebuchadnezzar had a, yet another terrifying dream. None of his advisors could help him. So he sent for Daniel, saying, I know that your God can solve all mysteries. Last night I had a dreadful dream. There stood before me an enormous tree towering above the land, strong and tall, with its topmost branches touching the sky. It could be seen at the very ends of the earth. The leaves were green and the branches were flattened with fruit for every living creature, animals, and shelter beneath its bows and birds lived happily in the branches. Then came a messenger from heaven who cried out who cried out that it must be cut down from the fruit scattered. The birds and the animals were to flee, but the stump and its roots were to remain, and the messenger said, Let him live outside among the animals for seven long years, with the mind of a wild animal, so all will know that God alone controls all kingdoms and chooses their rulers. Daniel hardly knew what to say. Your majesty, he replied, clearly upset. How I wish that this dream was not meant for you. You see, you are that tree. Your empire is strong and great and covers the earth. Yet, unless you learn to honor God, you will be cut down and become mad and will be forced to live like a wild animal for seven years. But the stump of the tree will remain, will remain and you lose your pride and worship God, then he will give you back your greatness again. So please, your majesty, he begged, take heed now and follow God's will, and then maybe this will never come to pass. Did you understand the story? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You did? <coughs> huh? You did? We're, we're, we're going to cover that in what we've been speaking about in class today. And uh, I just want to show you the importance of how, how important God is and his word is just love for us. Okay? You want to pray? You want to pray for us? I'll pray. Lord, thank you for the will of loving us and uh, just the freedom you've given to love you. And uh, may we share your message and your glory around uh, to our friends and family and may they be able to uh, freely just love you and uh, just uh, thank you for the peace uh, the comfort you constantly give it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys. This time. Today is from Ezekiel 39, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> Son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and drag you along. I will bring you far from the north and send you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand. On the mountains of Israel you will fall, you and all your troops, and the nations with you. I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals. You will fall in the open field, for I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in safety in the coastlands, and they will know that I am the Lord. I will make known my holy name among the, my people Israel. I will no longer let my holy name be profaned, and the nations will know that I, the Lord, am the Holy One in Israel. It is coming. It will surely take place, declares the Sovereign Lord. This is the day I have spoken of. Here in the reading. And if you will, turn back one chapter to Ezekiel 38, as we continue our series, The Prophecy Top Ten Countdown. I want to ask you if you've been hearing some things in the news. For example, have you been hearing things about Russia? Heard anything about Russia in the news lately? Russia invading Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you heard anything about artificial intelligence? Is that a big deal today? <coughs> Have you heard anything about Israel and her enemies? Like we mentioned that earlier. 
All that is going to come to the surface in our time in the Word today because we're resuming our countdown of prophecies top 10 and we looked at number 10 which is the very next thing to happen in God's calendar and that is the great disappearance the mystery disappearance we refer to it as the rapture of the church Paul described it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he explained the fact that I want to encourage those of you who've lost loved ones what an appropriate passage for Memorial Day weekend celebrating people who've lost loved ones who've given their lives in celebration uh, and honor for this uh, particular uh, service of our country. Uh, the fact that he, there he says uh, that we uh, ultimately the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up, raptured, snatched up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Dr. Charles Ryrie called this a signless and timeless event. And it's the very next event that Scripture says will happen. It's also described in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where Paul says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So that's number 10. And that leads to number 9, the 70 weeks and the mystery ruler. We saw that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, where Daniel has given a vision and uh, Michael the archangel comes to him and tells him about the 70 weeks or sevens of time that are determined. The first 69 went from the going forth of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem given by King Nebuchadnezzar all the way up to the coming of Jesus uh, riding into Jerusalem uh, on, on a uh, actually on a colt, the foal of a donkey, on the triumphal entry. And uh, that 70th week uh, would be something in the future. And uh, it would be described in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he, that is the coming prince, will confirm a covenant, that is a peace treaty, uh, for one week, one seven. So ultimately, what will happen here is that someone, some great ruler, will initiate a peace treaty with Israel, guaranteeing their security for seven years, and that will initiate what we refer to in the Bible as the tribulation period. That period is still future today. And in the middle of the tribulation, he's going to break that covenant. And that's what we're going to zero in on today, the details of how that's going to happen. But that's in Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. And you might also jot down 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Those references describe the coming of the Antichrist. And while that's going on on earth, that first part of the tribulation, we have the believers final exam. In our countdown, that's number 8. We have 10, 9, 8. Number 8. The believer's final exam, the judgment seat of Christ. And that happens uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. We shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where we will be evaluated on the basis of our works. And we're told that they will either be classified as gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And so your service to the Lord through our church your service to the Lord in whatever capacity will be rewarded by the Lord if it's done for the right reason. And then we have number seven, the first half of the tribulation. We looked at that a few weeks ago, and uh, we looked at uh, the calendar from Daniel 9, 27, and the events, the seven seals of Revelation chapter 6. Things begin to fall apart on the earth. Uh, there's, uh, first of all, a ruler who rides a white horse, he has a bow, but he doesn't have arrows, and so he conquers without warfare. And then after that follows famine, pestilence, and illness, and death, and the grave, Sheol. And those four horsemen uh, take place during the opening of those seals. And today we come to number six, and I've titled this The Attack of Russia and the Midweek Break. 
This is the breaking of the covenant. The context in, in the book of Ezekiel, and by the way, how many of you have studied the book of Ezekiel at some time? Not a lot of you, a few of you have. It is a wonderful book. It is a book where the phrase, then shall I know, then shall they know that I am the Lord, is the dominant phrase. In fact, I remember when I was a teenager, our youth pastor gave me the assignment of reading through Ezekiel and finding out how many times does it say, then shall they know that I am the Lord. I can't remember the exact number, but it's a big number. But Ezekiel is all about God's response to the uh, sins of the nation and the nation's leaders. Chapter 22 and chapter 34 especially focus on that. But now when we come to Ezekiel chapter 38, Ezekiel gets another vision. By the way, this is interesting because it is immediately after Ezekiel 37. You say, Pastor, we could figure that out. 37 and 38 kind of come in sequence. Well, chapter 37 is a chapter about a field filled with dry bones. And those dry bones come to life. Remember the song, the hip bone connected to the leg bone, Ezekiel saw the wheel and all of that? Well, that's really where this originated. And these bones come to life. And I believe that that's the restoration to the nation Israel, which was dead and scattered back into the land. You remember when that happened? 1948. Yeah, three years after I was born. That's when they came back into the land and reconstituted a nation. And today, have you noticed how many people across our world and in our country and on our college campuses are yelling from the river to the sea? And you know what they mean by that? They want to stamp out the nation that God brought back out of all of the lands. Now, is that nation there in belief in Jesus as Messiah? No, they're not yet. But God has brought them back. And remember that he brought the dry bones together before he gave them life. And it's exactly the picture of what we have today. You can read Ezekiel 37 this afternoon. But now we want to look at Ezekiel 38. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him. This is the attack of Gog and Magog found here. We have an allied group of invading armies. And that phrase, the, the prince of Rosh, translated the chief prince. Did you notice how similar that word Rosh is to a certain country that's dominating the headlines today? Russia? See, that whole word has the idea of the head of the chief. And what has been the agenda of Russia since even before the Soviet Union? To dominate the world. Now, you say, can we be sure about this? All right, will you notice the word Meshach? There is a similarity. What is the capital city of Russia? Moscow. Moscow. Meshach and Moscow, very similar. We can't be totally dogmatic about that. But I believe it's very likely that he's talking about the capital city. Tubal, there is a city named Tubalsk in Russia that is one of the primary cities. And God says to the prophet, prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, I am against you, O God, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And I will turn you around and put hooks into your jaws. By the way, what kind of animal is turned around with hooks in its jaws. A bear. That's how they move bears around. What was the symbol of Russia? Bear. Russian bear. I will lead you out with all your army, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now there's the invading army but there's more than just the army from the far north, as they're going to be described in verse 6. That's how we know if you take an arrow and draw it straight up north from Israel, you wind up in the middle of Russia. Now notice Persia. Does anybody remember the modern name of Persia? Iran. Iran, yes. Ethiopia. 
And then you have Libya. You're familiar with those countries in North Africa. And uh, they are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer with all its troops, the house of Togarma. That's up near the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. From the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. So you've got Iran to the east. You've got Russia and these countries to the north. To the west and the south, you've got the African countries of Libya and Ethiopia. And here's what he's saying. All of these countries are going to converge on the land of Israel. And that's going to happen during the middle of the tribulation. And uh, this is what's happening. He says, prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered, and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. See, they've been regathered. They've been brought back to the land. They've been there in the land. And here comes this invasion. Now remember, here's what's happened. Uh, Israel, we know today, is under a vicious attack. There are people that want to get rid of them. But somebody is going to step forward shortly after the body of Christ, the church, you and me and those of us who trusted Christ have gone to heaven. And this individual is going to step out and we're going to look at him in detail in a moment from Revelation 13. But he's going to put a peace treaty together to guarantee the safety of Israel. Already they're talking about, will it be Saudi Arabia? Will it be Egypt? Will it be some other country? And they go back and forth on all of that. We have no idea. Somebody's going to step forward, and we'll look at that in a moment. They're going to put a peace treaty together. There's going to seem to be a peace and security. And then all of a sudden this invasion takes place, and these people come. And it says in verse 9, you will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops, and many people with you. And at that time, verse 10, you'll make an evil plan. I'll go up against the land of unwalled villages to a peaceful people. There are not walls around Tel Aviv and Jerusalem today. There's a wall at the old city. But basically, Jerusalem or Israel is a land of unwalled cities, peaceful people. At this time, dwelling securely because of that peace treaty. Dwelling without walls and bars and gates to take plunder and booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited, a people gathered from the nations. That's in verse 12. And then notice he says, the other countries, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions will say, are you coming to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty? So what we have is the invasion all the way up to verse 17. And why is this going to happen? Verse 16, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land in the latter days. My land, I so that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I've spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. So there's God's response coming up in verse 18 and following. It will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, the Lord God says, My fury will show in my face, for in my jealousy and in my fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that all the fish and the birds and the creeping things will be shaken at my presence, the mountains thrown down, the steep places fall, and I will call for a sword against God throughout all my mountains. Every man's sword will be against his brother. Now this is vivid description. Notice what he's saying. These armies will come from every direction, and especially from the far north, and they will invade Israel, which has been protected by this covenant with the Antichrist. And uh, at that time, that invasion will take place and it will seem like the Antichrist is going to be destroyed and defeated and perhaps even killed. We'll get to that in just a minute. But the bottom line is God is going to intervene with a massive earthquake and then later in chapter 39 and, uh, we're going to hear about pestilence and bloodshed and rain, flooding rain. 
great hailstones, fire and brimstone. And God says then, the last part of verse 23, there's that phrase, then they shall know that I am the Lord. That's the attack. And chapter 29 gives us the divine destruction of God and Magog. That's what Betty read for us. The doom is pronounced in verses 1 through 6. The Lord says, I am against you, O God, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I'm going to lead you into the land. Then I'm going to knock the bow out of your left hand, cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all the troops and peoples who are with you, and you'll fall in the open field. And then notice God says, I'm going to judge your homelands. I'll send fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands. And here's the phrase again, then they shall know that I am the Lord. See, people today think there's no hope for Israel. People today think, boy, there's a good chance that with Iran behind them and all these other countries, that that, that country could very well be wiped out. And there may be some terrible things happen in Israel. In fact, if you read the first part of the tribulation, Revelation chapter 6 and 7, you'll see that it is very bad. But God is going to bring judgment on those who come against Israel. And he says in verse 8 of chapter 39, Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, saith the Lord God. Now turn with me briefly to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Wish I had another hour to expound all of this for you, but I'm not going to do that. Don't get panicky. We'll get you out in time for lunch. Revelation chapter 13, you have the uh, here um, the deadly wound of Antichrist and the false prophet. First of all, we see in chapter 13, verse 1, John is standing on the sand of the sea. By the way, we'll deal with all of this in much greater detail when we work our way through the book. There's a beast. He rises up out of the sea. Now notice that. The sea is often a symbol of Gentile nations. Uh, it says the wicked are like the troubled sea back in Isaiah. There is no peace, said my God, to the wicked. He has seven heads and ten horns, a blasphemous crown, a blasphemous name. And notice he's similar to a leopard, has the feet of a bear, a mouth like that of a lion, and he's given power by the dragon. Remember who the dragon is? That's the Satan. devil, Satan, absolutely. In fact, he's going to be referred to later as the old serpent, the devil, called Satan. In fact, that was back in chapter 12. He's cast out of heaven. So the dragon gives power and authority to this beast, this wild animal, and to Christ. And then notice he suffers a deadly wound. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. And the way I would interpret and understand this is this invasion of Israel actually leads to uh, apparently either a, a, an assassination attempt in which he is mortally wounded and somehow survives and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. One of my most vivid memories in recent history is the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. I would imagine many of you remember that shooting that took place. In fact, I had been just a few years before that to a convention at the Washington Hilton Hotel. Uh, Christian broadcasters was familiar with that. And when that happened, people didn't realize at first just how deadly that wound was. But Reagan survived that and was able to continue his presidency. And that's, I believe, exactly what's going to happen here. They're going to think he's dead when these armies from Russia and all these places come in. One of those seven heads is, going to, is representative of his rule in Israel, the covenant that he's made. And that invasion is going to seem like it's going to take him out. But he's going to be, actually people are going to be amazed and all the world will worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and worship the beast. Now notice what's going on here. The whole world, literally, now remember, Christians have been taken to heaven. There have been some tribulation saints that have come to Christ during the first half of the tribulation. But here these people are worshiping the dragon, Satan, 
They're worshiping the beast, saying, who is like him? Who is able to make war with him? He didn't need to make war. He was able to conquer without that. And he was given the authority to blaspheme, verse 5, for 42 months. Add that up. It's three and a half years. And the result of all that is it was granted to him to make war with the saints, verse 7, to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names had not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is chilling, folks, but it gives us the reminder that ultimately the victory comes from the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Now, you had the dragon, Satan. Do you remember what Satan's objective was? I want to be God. Revelation 14, Ezekiel 28. I want to be like the Most High. Now, here comes the beast out of the land, the Antichrist, as he's called. And that's referred to in 2 Thessalonians 2. He is the one who is the fake of Jesus Christ. And then we have a third character here. Verse 11, the false prophet. And he promotes the worship of Antichrist. Saw so another beast, and he came up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast, causes people to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He does great miracles, makes fire come down from heaven, and deceives the people on earth by those signs with which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. He is the one who engineers, notice this in verse 16, causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or their foreheads so that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast, the number of his name. You know, people used to wonder, how could that possibly happen? It's just like back in a previous chapter where those two witnesses were slain and their bodies lay in the streets of Jerusalem. But people looked at them from all over the world and people said, how could that happen? Two words, cable television. People now, satellite television. People can see all over the world what's happening in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and in, uh, uh, in uh, Gaza, places like that. And here you've got a system, an economic system, a cashless society where you have something implanted in your in your hand, in your forehead, and those give you identity. And if you don't have those, you don't buy, you don't go to the grocery store, you don't sell. You see how bad it's going to get in the last part of the tribulation? And the only people that don't have that are the people whose names have been written in the book of life. And those whose names have not been written in the book of life all have that and they've all worshipped the devil. The mark of the beast. Let's make some applications as we close. Number one, things are bad in the world today, but they're going to get a lot worse. They're going to get so much worse, people will not even be able to imagine. But the good news is God is in charge. All through this chapter, we were talking about this in Sunday school today. If you look, for example, at verse 5 of chapter 13, two times there, twice in verse 7, it was given him. Verse 14, it was given to him. Verse 15, it was given, it was granted to him. God is in charge even of all this terrible business that's happening with the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, who, by the way, takes the place of the Holy Spirit. You have an unholy trinity, the devil trying to take the place of God the Father, the Antichrist trying to take the place of God the Son, and the false prophet trying to take the place of of the Holy Spirit who tries to, who gets people to worship Jesus. The good news is we'll be gone. Christians will be raptured. We'll be out of the picture. We'll be in heaven. But deception and chaos will be all over the earth. But the good news is that Christ is coming back. Amen. If you haven't trusted Him, that's the thing you need to do today. And if you have trusted Him as Savior, then you need to make sure you're walking with Him, living for Him, doing everything you can to bring others to
to saving faith in Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It's living, it's powerful, it's truth. And we pray right now, Lord, that you would accomplish your purposes through your word. Give us understanding of these somewhat complex portions of scripture that we might bring glory to you in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. Stand together and sing number 453, stanzas one and four, I gave my life for thee. Be with you. And with you also.